In April of this year, at the age of 103, the last prosecutor of the Nuremberg trials, Ben Ferenc, passed away. He was a professor of international law and actively advocated for the establishment of the Permanent International Court, similar to the Nuremberg Tribunal. This court would be able to hold accountable the leaders of states and governments accused of committing war crimes. Ferenc even authored several books on this subject. As a result, the International Criminal Court was established in Hague in 2002. Its most notable action to date has been the issues of an arrest warrant for Russian President Vladimir Putin. The Nuremberg trials had a profound influence on the development of international criminal law. For the first time, leaders who were the heads of an entire state found themselves in the dock accused of committing war crimes and genocide. This gives the right to call the Nuremberg Tribunal the foremost court of the 20th century. What lessons can be learned from the Nuremberg experience? What principles of international law can be applied when addressing to the issue of Russian aggression? And how can a new Nuremberg trial be conducted against Russian war criminals? Today we will discuss this unique judicial process, its historical significance, and draw parallels with the present day. Until the mid-20th century, armed conflict was the standard method of resolving disputes between countries. For many countries afterwards, the ancient Roman principle of voia victis. Voia to the vanquished prevailed. This meant that the terms were always dictated by the victors, and they could treat the defeated however they pleased. There were no restrictions on the rights of the victors to punish the former adversaries. The concept of war crime didn't exist. In the Middle Ages, laws and customs of war began to emerge, gradually shaping the modern understanding of permissible methods of armed conflict. In the 17th century, the Dutch jurist Hugo Grotius, in his book On the Law of War and Peace, was the first to formulate a system of principles aimed at regulating armed conflicts. Grotius is called the father of the international law. However, his ideas only found practical implementation two centuries later. Starting from the second half of the 19th century, the establishment of the Red Cross made it possible to care for the wounded and provided basic rights for prisoners of war. With the emergence of international law in more modern sense in the late 19th century and early 20th century, a series of international treaties were developed and concluded. There's a Hague and Geneva Convention, which regulate the conduct of armed conflicts, the protection of civilian population, and the rights of prisoners of war. The Hague Convention established rules of war on land and at sea, limiting the types of weapons that warring parties could use and defining the protection of cultural and religious objects. Those conventions laid the foundation of international humanitarian law. The series of Geneva Conventions set standards of humanitarian law, rules for the protection of victims in armed conflicts. They are the primary documents aimed at protecting the lives, health and dignity of people during wars. Both series of conventions have been signed by the majority of countries in the world. Since the early days of the First World War in 1914, the international community had recognized the concept of war crimes. However, they were not agreed upon sanctions and punishments to be applied to those who violated the established laws and customs of war. There were no international courts to handle such crimes. Most significantly, the sanctions for war crimes were limited to actual perpetrators, the lower-ranking individuals. Soldiers or officers could be found guilty of 
particularly notable and widely publicized atrocities by the leaders of nations remained it unpunished. From the onset of the First World War, the Allied countries' public demanded not only military victory but also the punishment of German war criminals. For the first time in the world history, the question of holding high-ranking officials accountable for developing aggressive plans and issuing criminal orders arose. The opinions of world leaders at the time were divided. British Prime Minister David Lloyd George initiated the campaign named Hank the Kaiser. The slogan gained popularity among the British, who expanded the list to include German generals and politicians responsible for starting the war. On the other hand, US President Woodrow Wilson believed that establishing a tribunal was inappropriate. He felt that a court of the victors over the vanquished would set a dangerous precedent. The Treaty of Versailles, which concluded the Great War, included an article that provided for the extradition of Wilhelm II. The German Emperor, the primary war criminal at the establishment of a court to try him. However, by that time, the former Kaiser had found refuge in the Netherlands. Queen Wilhelmina, his distant relative, refused to extradite him. The matter was considered closed. Attempts to prosecute other war criminals also proved unsuccessful. At least over 900 names was complied with the intention of holding them accountable. However, when the Weimar Republic government received the list, they refused to surrender them to a court. Furthermore, the Allied countries were warned of the prospects of a new war if they persisted. The failure to prosecute war criminals after the First World War became one of the reasons for the more determined stance of key politicians during the subsequent attempt, the creation of the Nuremberg Tribunal. After the war, new perspectives emerged regarding the issue of dealing with the war criminals. A debate unfolded as to whether the leaders who were responsible for the policies that led to the war and commissions of criminals acts should be held accountable. It was during this time that the idea was first expressed to consider the war itself as a crime and to establish punishment for its initiation. The concept of prosecuting individuals for the crime of starting a war gained traction and began to shape the discussion of accountability for war-related atrocities. The outbreak of the Second World War in September 1939 once again made the issue of war crimes and punishment for them relevant. By 1945, the problem of punishment was becoming increasingly urgent. The scale became apparent thousands of suspects, tens of thousands of crimes. Gradually, a firm conviction formed that the leaders of Germany had created a criminal regime. The Nazis planned the war, violating all agreements and guarantees. War crimes were part of the deliberate policy. At the end of the war, the liberation of concentration camps led to an understanding of the scope of the responsibility. During the war, each country in the anti-Hitler coalition demanded punishment for those who committed war crimes. For the first time in history, punishment for war crimes became not just a consequence of the war itself, but was declared an official policy during the course of it. As the Allied armies liberated the countries of the European continent, materials from the liberated concentration camps became widely known to the public. Footage from Buchenwald and Dachau shocked everyone without exception. The pressure on politicians increased exponentially. The widespread and unprecedented publicity called for decisive action by the United Nations to punish the criminals. During the war between the anti-Hitler coalition countries, 
consultations were held at all levels regarding the fate of Nazi criminals and the format of a future trial. Discussions were held on who specifically should face justice. Numerous meetings and conferences took place. The establishment of the International Military Tribunal was discussed by the leaders of the countries at the Tehran and Yalta conferences. The idea of creating a unified court with the representatives of the victorious nations didn't come immediately. There were many supporters of swift execution of the Nazi leadership without a trial. This position was held for a long time not only by Stalin, but also by U.S. Secretary of State Cordell Hull and even Prime Minister of Great Britain Winston Churchill. The only difference was the disagreement on the scale of the executions. At the Tehran conference, Stalin expressed his desire to execute 50,000 German leaders. However, he later referred to it as a joke. Dictators always have a very specific sense of humor. Churchill disagreed only on the scale, but not on the idea itself. He advocated for the swift execution for a small group of the most important criminals. Foreign Secretary Antony Eden prepared a list of 41 names for him. In addition, the term trial was understood differently by the participants of the discussion. As early as 1944, the British Foreign Office believed that the trial of the German leaders would not take more than six hours. It seemed logical to everyone that the guilt of Hitler and his closest henchmen did not require evidence. Until the end of the war, the question of uh, whether it would be a formal trial or a full-fledged process was not resolved. In addition, the possibility of self-justice or lynching was always considered, as happened with Italian dictator Mussolini. The final political decision to establish the tribunal was made at the Yalta conference in February 1945. However, when it came to discussing specific details, disagreement arose. At the conference of four powers in London in August 1945, after long and complex discussions, the Charter of the International Military Tribunal was adopted. It guaranteed the protection of sensitive points for each of the victorious countries. For the USSR, it was Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. There was also a lot of debate about the list of defendants. The crimes were so massive and there were so many defendants that it was decided to hold several Nuremberg trials. The first one, which we are talking about today, was a major Nuremberg trial of the top Nazi criminals. It included the political and military leadership of the Third Reich, economic and industrial leaders, as well as the leader of the SS and police. And then the subsequent Nuremberg trials took place. Trials of Nazi doctors, trials of Nazi judges, the case of the Einstadt Gruppen, the case of uh, racial crimes, and so on. Why was the Nuremberg chosen? Why not Berlin, the stronghold of Nazi Germany, where the Reich Chancellery? Gestapo and SS headquarters were located. Why not Munich, the birthplace of the National Socialist Germany Workers' Party? However, Nuremberg also held symbolic significance for Nazi Germany. Party rallies were held there, and everyone remembers the famous footage by Leni Riefenstahl from those grand events. Additionally, Nuremberg was not heavily damaged after the war and had the necessary infrastructure to conduct such complex undertaking as the trial of the Nazis. The joint indictment prepared by the four prosecution teams consisted of 65 pages. The Nazi leaders were charged with the following. Aggressive plans and actions. Germany was accused of invading the territory of Czechoslovakia, Poland, the USSR, France and other European countries. Conspiracy against peace, planning, preparation, and waging of aggressive war, 
a violation of international treaties, war crimes, violation of rules and customs of war, murders of civilians and prisoners of war, enslavement, destruction of cities, crimes against humanity, systematic and mass extermination of people based on their racial, ethnic or religious affiliation, genocide, deportations, forced labor, human experimentation. Indeed, the indictment of the Nuremberg Tribunal was the first time introduced the term genocide into official documents. The International Tribunal itself consisted of four members and their deputies. Each country sent their tribunal members and the deputies to Germany, totaling eight individuals. The tribunal members included Major General of Justice Iona Nikitschenko from the Soviet Union, Francis Biddle as the U.S. Chief Prosecutor, Professor Donadieu de Vabres, representing France. The chairman of the tribunal was chosen to be Jeffrey Lawrence, a British representative. It is worth nothing that members of the Soviet delegation, Prosecutor Rudenko and Iona Nikitschenko, had extensive experience participating in Stalinist repressions. They advocated for expediting the process, considering it a mere formality with a predictable result. The process itself began ceremoniously on November 20, 1945, in the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg. The tribunal was presented with the indictment against 24 former Nazi leaders. The principal defendant was, of course, Hermann Göring. After the suicide of Hitler, Goebbels and Himmler, Göring was the highest-ranking Nazi. As uh, architects of the concept of concentration camps and the creator of the Gestapo, he was perceived as a key defendant. The other defendants consisted of the highest political, military and economic leadership of the Third Reich, leaders of the occupying authorities in the conquered countries, Reich ministers and party officials. Among them stood Julius Streicher. He was not a prominent party or government official. However, his newspaper Der Stromer uh, became a symbol of anti-Semitism. Stryker himself was charged with incitement to murder Jews falling under the accusation of crimes against humanity. It serves as a reminder for today's propagandists who, through Russian television channels, daily incite violence against Ukrainians to contemplate their own fate. Stryker was such a controversial figure that even in the Nuremberg prison, other Nazis refused to dine in his company. Additionally, several organizations were accused, such as the SS, SD, and Gestapo, the leadership of the NSDAP, the general staff, and so on. Each of the defendants was entitled to a defense attorney. In total, their interests were represented by 27 lawyers, assisted by over 100 assistants and secretaries. During the defense, the defendants did not attempt to deny the fact of committing war crimes. Instead, they employed various legal strategies. For instance, they argued that the Nazi government during the war years behaved similarly to the government of Allied powers. They claimed that the former leaders of the Third Reich were brought to trial solely because of the country suffered defeat. Additionally, almost all the defendants employed a simple tactic, shifting the blame onto deceased figures such as Hitler, Himmler and others, who were the primary leaders of the terror. Adolf Hitler's name was mentioned 12,000 times during the trial, more than the names of the five main defenders combined. Ultimately, this defense tactic influenced the verdicts of half of the accused. The defendants attempted to raise topics that representatives of the victorious countries did not wish to address, 
For example, the Soviet Union had a whole list of undesirable subjects. Besides the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, this included the occupation of Baltic state, issues related to the socio-political system of the USSR, which strongly resembled the regime of Nazi Germany and other matters of Soviet-German cooperation. This greatly concerned the Soviet delegation and Prosecutor Rudenko nervously refuted any similarities between the National Socialist and Soviet dictatorships. At the insistence of the Soviet side, the indictment included an episode in which the authorities of Nazi Germany were accused of the murder of approximately 11,000 Polish officers in the Katyn forest near Smolensk. However, during the examination of this episode in the courtroom, it became evident that the Soviet side had not provided substantial evidence. The consideration of the cutting case was halted by the tribunal, and the episode is absent from the text of this verdict. Even after the dissolution of the USSR, it was claimed there that the Nuremberg Tribunal has declared the Germans guilty of Katyn massacre. The Nuremberg trials lasted almost a year. At the beginning of the process, the Nazi leaders definitely took their places in the dock, emphasizing that they were only there because they had lost the war. Everything changed with the screening of the documentary film presented by the Soviet delegation. In the displayed footage, the world witnessed hundreds of thousands of tortured and murdered women, children and elderly individuals. Cities and villages lay in ruins, burned to the ground along with their inhabitants. People who had endured horrific medical experiments and survived, the horrors of concentration camps were shown, and the world was horrified. After this viewing, the main German leaders responsible for genocide and the initiation of aggressive warfare had no chances of justifying their actions. The work of the judges was accompanied by significant disagreements and discussions. The Soviet judges advocated for the death penalty for all the defendants and the recognition of all German organizations as a criminal. Their colleagues from other countries disagreed. They had experience working in democratic legal system and didn't want to turn the tribunal into Stalinist show trial. Robert Ley took his own life shortly before the start of the trial. Gustav Krupp was declared terminally ill and relieved of responsibility. Twelve individuals were sentenced to death by hanging. The chief defendant, Reich Marshal Hermann Görig, took his own life a few hours before their execution. In a note he left behind, it was written, Reich Marshals don't hang. Those sentenced to imprisonment that served their sentences in a special prison in Spandau. The last inmate of the prison and the final defendant of the Nuremberg trials, Rudolf Hess, according to the official version, took his own life in 1987, at the age of 93. Nuremberg trials became the final example of cooperation among the Allied powers and one of the early fronts of the Cold War. During the process, Churchill delivered his famous Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, which is considered the beginning of the Iron Curtain era. Interestingly, this gave some of the defendants hope for a lighter fate due to the fracture in the anti-Hitler coalition. The trials also served as uh, the last forum where the National Socialists openly criticized Soviet rule. The series of Nuremberg trials played a crucial role in denazifying post-war Germany. In continuation of Nuremberg, the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, better known as the Tokyo Trials, was established. It aimed to prosecute Japanese war criminals. 
the Nuremberg trials became a significant event of the 20th century, the most famous judicial process in history. It marked the beginning of the formation of modern international criminal law. During the trial, a prolonged discussion on concepts such as genocide and human rights emerged. However, it was an exceptional occurrence. The tribunal was created for a specific case, the condemnation of leaders who initiated the Second World War and organized mass killing and genocide. For half a century, there was no direct continuation of such a court. It was only 50 years later, after the war in Bosnia began, the United Nations Security Council established the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And following the genocide in Rwanda, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda was created. After years of discussions and consultations, the international community finally reached a decision to establish a permanent institution, the International Criminal Court in The Hague. It was founded based on the Roman Statute and commenced its operation in 2002. Unfortunately, not all countries ratified the statute and recognized the jurisdiction of this new organ of international law. The major powers, the United States and Russia, initially signed but later withdrew the signatures. Asian giants like China and India didn't show any willingness to join the Rome Statute. As of June 2023, Ukraine has signed but not ratified the Roman Statute, meaning that the court doesn't have jurisdiction on its territory. However, the International Criminal Court can consider situations that occurred in countries that have not joined the Rome Statute. In such case, a decision from the United Nations Security Council is required. Alternatively, if the state itself can address a situation that happened within its territory. This was the case with the Russian aggression towards Ukraine. The arrest warrant for Putin became a significant outcome of international criminal courts, activities concerning the Ukrainian issue and a big step towards justice. Immediately after the start of the full-scale Russian aggression in March 2022, Ukrainian authorities began calling for an international tribunal against Russia. They were supported by many European politicians, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom Gordon Brown and John Major, as well as other British politicians, lawyers and public figures, stated the necessity of creating a new international tribunal. It should investigate the actions of President Putin and his circle that led to the invasion of Ukraine. A petition demanding the establishment of a special tribunal and holding Putin personally accountable for the illegal invasion was created. It can be signed by any concerned citizen of the world. As of June 2023, the petition has gathered just over 2 million signatures. It's truly empowering when you can shape history with your own hands. The January 2023, the European Parliament adopted a resolution of the establishment of a special tribunal to prosecute the crime of aggression against Ukraine. The key objective of the future process is to hold the top leadership of the Russian Federation accountable for committing the crime of aggression. However, much practical work still needs to be done for the purpose. The crucial aspect is to form a unified opinion among the key political players. Ben Ferenc, the last prosecutor of the Nuremberg Tribunal, gave an interview shortly before his death, stating that he never thought he would witness a war in Europe again. An invasion of another country is unquestionably a war crime, declared the former prosecutor.
American judge Robert Jackson formulated the main task of the Nuremberg Tribunal as follows. We must make it clear to Germans that the issue for which the former leaders are being brought to a trial is not the last of the war, but that they started it. And today, there is a growing confidence that the trial against the Russian Federation leaders who initiated the aggressive war against Ukraine and are responsible for tens of thousands of victims will definitely take place. What it will be called and where it will take place – in Mariupol, in Bucha, Izum, Bakhmut, another destroyed town in Ukraine – only time will tell. To be continued.